about it. Um, Andrew Feinstein is going to be moderating tonight's discussion. He has also covered this uh, book, uh, The Shadow World Inside the Global Arms Trade. Uh, it was out a while ago, but still, still very relevant. Um, so before, before I hand you over to Andrew, uh, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent. Um, and when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we're broadcasting live this evening. So over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much. Good evening and welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with Ian and to have you here with us. As was mentioned, I think the reason that I'm here is that my last book was on the global arms trade. Um, a slightly bigger picture than Ian has dealt with in this book, but with huge amounts of overlap, I think. Um, and besides that, I was an ANC member of parliament in South Africa for almost eight years um, and resigned out of protest at the ANC government's refusal to allow a full and unfettered investigation into a hugely corrupt arms deal. Um, that continues to plague South African politics today. But that's slightly off the purpose of our conversation tonight. Ian's book is not only an extremely good book, very readable, but it is a very, very important book about a devastating subject. But rather than take my word for it, we thought that the way we'd get going this evening is for Ian to read a little bit from the beginning of the book and from the end of the book. So we'll start there. It began with the death. The five-year-old had lain alone with his lifeless mother all night long, curled up at her cold feet. It was only when the thin light of dawn lifted some of the darkness from the bedroom that the neighbours had heard the boy's cries. Did people realise what had happened in those sunless hours before? The bullet had entered the left side of the young woman's temple and exit at the back of her head, splattering flecks on the leprous wall. There'd often be wild-voiced arguments in that cramped house, but no one ever thought it would come to this. After the boy was found, the police arrived quickly but the murderous lover had already fled that Brazilian city, and, like the gun he had used, he was nowhere. By the time we reached the quiet roadside home, the child had also been spirited away, covered in a blanket, lifted from his dark pieta, and carried out into the light. His mother was still inside. Cars passed, leaving Sao Paulo for the north, and we stood awkwardly and watched them go. They slowed down and watched us too, a huddle of cops and a documentary crew crowded beside a white ambulance that was never really needed. A dog barked in the distance, and I took out my video camera and walked inside. The dead woman had run a small shop out the front, and it was filled with packets of coloured sweets and warm bottles of luminescent drinks. On the counter was a tray of Catholic pendants, which she had sold to the weary lorry, lorry drivers who would stop here. But these plastic icons had not helped her last night, and now she lay beyond past a dusty glass counter down a narrow there in a pool of silence. They say death smells sweet. That's what I thought as I walked into her bedroom. A taste touched my mouth and reminded me of the orange tinted bottles that lie in the shop's walls or the citrus chocolate puffs that lay neatly arranged in their shiny little packages. The air was thick with this smell. It had been over 12 hours since she had died and this was the start of summer. Her name was Lucileda and she was naked. I was not expecting that, but death rarely grants us dignity, so her breast hung to the side and the rest was uncovered. There was not much blood, save for a smear above her pinched, sallow face. Finding a corner, I set up my tripod and got to work. The police did not tell me to stop filming, but by now I was not even sure why I was doing this. My footage would never end up on the evening bulletins. The film I was making with Ramita Navai, an Anglo-Iranian journalist who was used to witnessing such things, was about the toll of violence in one of Brazil's deadliest cities, but Channel 4's news would never be able to show such intimate and murderous detail. I felt I had to do something, though, so I focused on her un and on the trinkets that lie in the top of her chip cabinet and shifted the lens onto the face of a purple bear I imagined her lover had once bought her. And the whir of the tape in the camera took the edge off the awkward quiet of the room. I carried on filming until the forensic examiners wrapped her in a heavy blanket 
And all I could think of as she was lifted heavily up, covered like her son had been, was how hot it was to have such a heavy blanket to sleep under. Why this book? You, you have a history as a journalist across a breadth of subjects. But this clearly is a very personal book. Well, just after witnessing that after effects of that killing, <clears throat> we, we drove to Sao Paulo's um, gun repository. And uh, we, we kind of went down into this dark basement and we entered this um, triple locked room um, where there were just thousands upon thousands of guns across the, the walls. And I remember thinking at that moment, it was a, um, a bit like some sort of horrific library where every single gun seemed to have this sort of background story. So there were corroded guns from plantation workers, there were rifles, there were AK-47s, there were Israeli Uzis. And every single gun had come from a different part of the world and ended up in this sort of um, basement of horrors. And I, I thought, in a way, that every gun told a story of, of disconnected realities. So the person who made it never saw that it ended up here. The person who used it to, make, to do a killing never saw it end up here. The person who hunted with it never saw it end up in this sort of um, repository. And it, it made me think of actually how the gun is separated in all of its different segments mm. in terms of its lifespan. So I thought, well, what happens if you, if you broke all of those up uh, and, and, and try to make each segment become part of a whole? So you and I, I, in the book, I'm, I mean, if I go through the chapters, I analyzed um, not only the gun, but then there's the dead, the wounded, the suicidal, the killers, the criminals, the police, then civilians, hunters, I look at gender under a chapter called Sex Pistols, and then it's traders, smugglers, lobbyists, manufacturers. So every single curious, isolated group around a gun is seen through my eyes as mm. part of a whole. But why, why guns? There's, there's the statement that has been credited to all sorts of people. Yeah. Some say that Sam Cummings, a CIA operative, um, who became an arms dealer, um, made a lot of money, yeah. and he always said, what was it? Um, people don't kill people, oh, yeah. guns kill people. Yeah, no. Um, gu guns, guns don't, guns don't, don't, guns kill. don't kill people. People kill people, not guns. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, yeah, the, 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 the I think as I, I've covered many killings, and I've covered wars um, or, or low-level conflicts. And the vast number of deaths that occur globally at the end of um, a, a gun or, or a knife occur outside war zones. So we, we kind of focus very much on what's happening, and probably rightly so to a degree, what's happening in Syria or what's happening in Ukraine. But Central America is having a kind of a war zone every single day and nobody really picks up on it. Um, for me, the, I think the gun was a fascination because it is the, the instrument that takes the most lives in war. So as many as 90% of deaths in war happen at the end of a gun. Um, it's by far the biggest taker of lives in terms of armed violence. So around 60% of all violent deaths in the world are um, with a gun. And in terms of suicides, I mean, in places like the United States, 20,000 people shoot themselves every year. So it has these deep and horrific impacts on so many lives. But then some person might see it. If all of their life is dictated by going out and hunting at the weekends, then they see the gun as you know, purely a tool to take down a deer. Um, from a news perspective, one thing that intrigued me is if someone's beheaded with a kitchen knife uh, in the dusty plains of Syria, it's, oh my god, they were beheaded. Someone's shot in the back of the head. It's, another dead. We don't mention the gun in that yeah. real shooting. And to me, the gun has almost just become a background noise in violence. And I thought, well, why don't we really look at what the gun is, the role the guns play? And the people who say guns don't kill people, people, people. kill people, I think they don't understand, as I've seen, the very physical transformation that occurs in a man when he picks up a gun. I mean, I, I, I say in the book, I interviewed this Brazilian killer pulled out a pistol in the middle of an interview and the atmosphere in the room 
tr became electric, it transformed. And all of a sudden, I didn't see a quiet little um, rat-faced man in front of me. I saw possibly the guy who was going to take my life. And, and everything turned on that, on that moment. Um, and, and, you know, I've seen it again and again. I was on patrol with soldiers in Iraq. And the way they carry their gun um, is it emboldens them to a degree that then they become reckless. So I think it, it transforms power, it transforms situations people who are in the midst of despair, it doesn't take a lot to pick up a gun and take your life. If you picked up a packet of pills, your chance of dying is around 6%. A gun is around 99.7%. I mean, before reading the book, I was completely unaware of the sort of impact that the gun has on suicide. How, how did you come across this particular issue? How, how did you effectively find the story? Well, um, I mean, I, I think the possible consequences of chasing horror around the world is a little element leaves with you. So um, I think there have been moments in a life where I've had very dark thoughts. Um, so I, I, I think when I looked through the prism of suicides, I, was, I kind of had an empathy for, for that horrific moment that mm. some people must go through where they think enough is enough. Um, the, 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 the root of examining that horror um, came in the form of this website called liveleak.com, which is an ugly little website that basically shows torture in Mexico or, or you know, people being run over by cars. I mean, it's a catalog of ugly deaths. But within there, there's a number of people who, who um, have Trans who are been captured on CCTV. So there's one guy, it really struck, uh, there's one particular story that stuck with me. But in the lead up, I saw one guy, for instance, he was arrested for drug dealing and he was in a prison cell. And he did, he, he was, the, the, the cop left and he poured himself a drink and he did, he did this. Put the glass down and then screwed back the top on the bottle reached inside his pocket and blew his brains out. The screwing back at the top of the bottle that really took yeah. me, because I was like, why would you do that? What is that? And, 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 and it's that kind of sudden transformation from living and being to not being that, that just struck me. And there was another clip on YouTube, which I've, I, in a kind of a pilgrimage almost, I, oh. I went to the, 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 the location where this young man killed himself. But um, a guy who was a, a rapper called Paradis in New York, his parents had both died of AIDS. He was 18, an orphan. He was 21. He was an orphan, mm -hmm. and he had psychological problems. And his girlfriend dumped him, and she went into a lift in the basement of this um, housing as association block in downtown New York. She walked into the lift. The lift door closed. He pulled out a gun, blew his brains out, and it was that transformation from kissing somebody and, and giving someone that farewell hug, just to not being. Um, it, it struck me as so profound. So I went back and I kind of was walking around asking people if they remembered this death oh. and nobody did uh, at that time. Um, and it, it just struck me that th th there are so many mechanisms in place that can take somebody away from the brink of despair. So for instance, they, 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 they charted what happened to people who throw themselves off the Golden Gate Bridge. And throwing yourself off the Golden Gate Bridge is rather similar to shooting yourself. Your chances of survival are 1%. So, the, but the 50 people they did find who had survived, they charted them afterwards. And the, something like 44 were still living 10 years on. So, so most of them hadn't gone on to kill themselves. Yeah. So if, uh, and, and the other um, thing about guns, it, guns was also a bit like um, ovens in 1950s Britain. Sylvia Plath took her yeah. life in this way. Um, the, the idea of being able to just turn on the gas, put your head in the oven and then kill yourself because you've had a, a bad day what caused it to be a huge suicides in Britain. When, when the government changed the poisonous of the nature of the gas, kill yourself in that way, um, suicides dropped overnight. It wasn't mm. as the NRA would have it. You'd go and find another way to kill yourself. And so for me, the gun, the handgun, is the ultimate sort of transformative moment. And this isn't a debate that anyone has in America. Everyone focuses on the number of people who are shot and killed. Yeah. They don't focus on the people who shoot themselves. There's 20,000 a year. I mean, it's just a huge number. Wow. Yeah. That's extraordinary. 
let me ask you something else that that perhaps you might find inappropriate, but you've spent a significant amount of, of your time traveling the world, looking at the devastation that is a consequence of, of guns. In the work that I've done for 15 years, I sometimes on a, on a Friday evening, I feel the need for a sort of a, a sanitizing shower to leave behind the arms dealers who I pursue, the military people I talk to. But you're dealing with it at an even more personal, individualized level than I do. Mm. What does that do for you? Well, in a way, this is kind of ultimately why the book <coughs> takes the form it took, is that in, I think I generally, in an in a, in a, in a interview or in a situation, I think it's just human nature. I try and find the best in somebody. I try and find that point of connection. Yeah. So, you know, I met, I, I, in the book, I, I met a, for, for the book, I met a, uh, an El Salvadorian uh, gang member who was called The Killer. And he probably had taken 80 lives. He had shot a four-year-old. I mean, you've got to sit there and you think, from a distance, you think, there's no way, in any way, shape, or form, I'm going to be able to find some form of human connection, but it's, it's just what we do, and what journalists do. You want yeah. someone to, to like you so they open up and tell you what their story is. And my motivation entirely as a journalist has always been I want to give the voiceless a voice. So you need them to have that kind of trust. So, no, I never really felt like I had to take a, dirt, a shower after mm. a particular meeting. In fact, the point of the book where I am angriest is the people who absolutely refuse whatsoever to meet me because they're the people who are making the massive profits from the guns. And they know, yeah. they Google me, and investigative journalists, they're never going to meet me in a month of Sundays. Um, but, but, but that failure to meet them means that, you know, then I can project onto them um, the, the hard facts of their lives to date, the fact that they've lied, the fact that they have made massive profits from guns that have killed children in schools, you know, that yeah. is all that they've given me to, 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 to latch onto. And actually, of, of the, the interaction I've had with gun companies, mm -hmm. um, I only managed to get into one um, gun production company. I spoke to a number of traders, but only one gun production company um, engaged with me. But if I, I, I did a calculation the other day, of, of all of the correspondence I had, more than 50% were from lawyers threatening to sue me. So, I mean, you know, you just don't even get into the realm of a conversation. Yeah. And that makes me want to have a shower. Not literally. <laughs> <laughs> but who, who are the people who are making the money? And, and are we talking serious money? You, you talk about small and light weapons. Yeah. Uh, they have a devastating impact. But they're not the money like no. the aircraft carriers, the jet fighters, the, the missiles. Well, well, in a curious way, I think that's why the gun, um, I think the gun has sort of l taken away from the news agenda for two reasons. One is it's so ubiquitous, people just assume it will be involved in killing. And then the other is because there's no amazingly outrageous headline of, you know, a $3 billion deal being struck with, you know, paybacks and, and, and underhand deals. The, the corruption occurs in very different ways. It's, you know, there aren't jets being, you know, people aren't being flown over on luxury jets with prostitutes in Hyde Park hotels <laughs> in the small arms industry. They may yeah. well be in the, in the bigger arms industry. Yeah. Um, and I think that that sort of also reduces the newspaper's interest because there's, no, there's never going to be a scandal that exposes, um, you know, a, a major gun trade. However, having said that, if you look inside the, the U.S., uh, military contracts, mm. I mean, they're, they're, they're 30 million, 50 million, 60 million. They go completely unreported. Um, and, and, you know, you get little nuggets, like the U.S. did a $10 million contract to produce AK-47s. And I'm thinking, what, the U.S. produces AK-47s? That's crazy, given, you know, the Cold War legacy. Yeah. And, and then I spoke to a spook about this, and they said to me that um, the reason was is because if, if, if there's a, something on, on CNN and some guy yeah. in ISIS is holding an AK-47, then you know, everyone goes, it's an AK-47. If they're holding an M-16, everyone's like, that's an American weapon. So it actually means that things, I mean, there's other reasons as well about yeah. ease of use and all the rest. Um, but um, the, 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 the intriguing corporation 
that I found in, in the book is the largest gun manufacturer in the world. It's called the Freedom Group. Right. And uh, predictably, it's an American group. Um, yeah. and, and in a kind of a curious way, I find the book, um, if I'm going to have, mm. I hope this doesn't sound too pretentious, but if there is a kind of a literary influence in the book, it probably mm. is Dante's Inferno. It starts off with this horrific death of a child and goes through the various shadow lands of death, suicide, wounded, and then goes into a more rarefied world of, you know, and ultimately ends up in this rarefied world of businessmen detached in high, high rises in New York. And the ultimate group is the capital management company that owns the Freedom Group. And they're called Cerberus, which is, as you know, the, the, the dog that guards the gates of hell. So it felt like I was coming out of hell and getting into this. And and um, actually, another uh, another Feinstein, but, but uh, uh, Feinberg, sorry, um, uh, Andrew Feinberg, not Andrew Feinstein. Andrew Feinberg um, runs uh, Cerberus, and he said to his board, um, "If any of you talk to the press, um, I or, or have your photograph in the press." Uh -huh. I will come to your house and kill you. The prison sentence will be worth it. So, you know, clearly there's a barrier of silence. They're not yeah. going to give me an interview. Um, <laughs> and, uh, I mean, I, 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 t I turned up at their offices and tried to blag my way in. It worked when I was in Ukraine. I, yeah. I managed to get in into this trader's offices before they kicked me out. But in New York, I just got, can I help you, sir? And then escorted out the building. <laughs> but a company like this, I would imagine judging by the fact that the Lockheed Martins, who, who are making billions, yeah. these guys aren't, as you say, but they're making a very good living. Yes. They're making good money. They make a billion, Sh not billions, but yeah, it's still a billion. Not, not yeah. bad, not bad not work bad if you can all. get it. No. What happens to a company like this after Sandy Hook? Well, um, interestingly, um, Feinberg's father mm -hmm. lived in Sandy Hook. Um, interestingly for me... So, so, so hang on, the father... The father of the guy who runs, who runs Cerberus the Capital. Right. So Cerberus Capital Management owns the Freedom Group, which runs uh, the company called Bushmaster. Yeah. And Bushmaster was the rifle that was used in to kill all those kids. So, so Feinberg's father lives in Sandy Hook. The, 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 America's largest gun show mm. in, is, is the Las Vegas... Um, it's called the Las Vegas Gun Show. Gun show. Yeah. And, and the people who organized that show also um, had their headquarters in Sandy Hook. And Sandy Hook was also the staging point 140 years ago yeah. of the first ever American attempt to create a machine gun. So Sandy Hook is this horrific sort of um, conglomeration of, of gun horrors. Um, after I went, I went to Sandy Hook and it's just sort of this eerie place. I was there around Halloween, mm. and every other, every other town in the region had ghouls and goblins on their, on their trees. Sandy Hook had flowers. People had hung flowers. Yeah. And it was just like, you know, the, the, the trauma of that is very... And yet this is happening right in the epicenter of gun-loving America. So people are traumatized. They, so the, what they end up putting it down to is that this just was a madman. However, the PR backlog, um, back lash mm. of what happened with the Bushmaster rifle. And the Bushmaster rifle was also used in the Washington sniper attack. Um, and it was used by Lanza um, when he killed a lot of those people in that cinema. Yeah. Um, so the Bushmaster rifle has this sort of legacy of being um, uh, uh, used by mass shooters. So, so Cerberus Capital Management and the Freedom Group, who, who owned Bushmaster, made this public statement that they were going to divest themselves of all of the arms. So everyone backed off, stopped, stopped screaming at them, waited for that to happen. A year on, their profits were on firearm sales were up 28%. Um, and they probably had made something in the region of $670 million greater profit the year following. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the reason is, is because President Obama, after Sandy Hook, said we need to consider tighter gun laws to stop yeah. this happening again. It caused such a rush on arms and ammunition, small arms and ammunition in America, that um, Australia complained that they had run out of bullets because everyone in America had bought them everywhere. The, world, the, world, the worldwide supply of bullets dried up. Mass, massive profits in the year following Sandy Hook because the and president said he's going to take your guns away. And Americans believe so forcefully that you know, a government taking your guns away is going to then you know, become a Stalinist government. Mm. The one thing that struck me while, while reading the book, I... I came from a situation where I took the decision to resign from my political career 
um, something I loved doing. I was very proud of working for Mandela, of working for the ANC. And I discovered that, for instance, when my own party, my own government, bought $10 billion of weapons that the country yeah. that we've barely used, because 300 million bribes were paid, yeah. including to our current president, who faced 783 counts of corruption, fraud, and racketeering in relation to the deal, charges that were dropped 10, to 10 days before he was elected. Hmm. I could not be as, and, and perhaps this is the right word, tolerant of the way in which you research, you meet with people, you talk to people, particularly who are deeply committed to the Second Amendment, as you say, who believe that this is perhaps one of the most important constitutional principles they have yeah. and that should be defended. What's going on in the US? Why do most of us who are British, European, from South Africa, like I am, where there is a major problem of criminal violence and why is the issue of gun tr control in the U.S. as it is? Yeah. Well, I, I think there's a couple of issues in, in, in what you said. Um, I think on the first sort of um, response to tolerance um, is I, th I think the book that you wrote um, had to be written in the sense that not many, well, there was very little out there in terms of a book about the arms trade. And so... You, you were cataloging hard truths. There is oh, a particular, if, if the, one of the challenges of this book, this book is a global book that 25 countries have visited. And one of the challenges actually is that there's kind of this amount of um, literature out there on American guns and around yeah. this amount yeah. on the rest of the world's guns. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I was very, so, so that, that's why I tried to do a global book and try to add um, some more things. The, the issue of tolerance, I think, comes in the fact that I think the gun is very complicated. So I've met, I've, I've met um, freedom fighters in South Africa, for instance, who were, were fighting for their independence um, in Mindanao, and, and they were carrying guns. Um, and, and there's certainly an argument there for self-defense and um, the right to, to um, self-governance. Um, certainly, I mean, I'm not condoning violence, mm. but I, I, I don't think it's as clear cut as saying I don't like guns or I do like mm -hmm. guns. I think there's a, you know, the, um, there's lots of communities in the world who need guns for hunting. Um, you know, that's their primary source of food. Um, the the American issue, though, not only dominates the entire gun debate, but what's the what's the what's the ultimate reason behind it? Well, Americans love to take you aside, and they, they often quote Piers Morgan when they do, because I'm English. <laughs> um, and they love to take you aside and give you a history lesson. And um, I can see why. I mean, I say in the book that the, the defeat of the Scots in the Battle of Culloden, mm -hmm. to some degree, can find resonance in the NRA's position today. Um, because after um, the English army went north and with musket and fire decimated the Scottish ranks, a lot, the generation after, <coughs> fled to America. So you got the creation of New Inverness, New Caledonia, uh, New Edinburgh, mm. uh, along the, um, the West Coast, particularly down in the South. And I think that, that they, they arrived in America with a, a pastoral sense of justice. And what I mean is if, you, if you're a sheep farmer and somebody nicks your sheep, you kill that person because they're, they're taking food off the table. So immediate retributive justice. A, a fundamental belief that some Englishman is going to kick down your door and kill your family. Oh. So a fear of a despotic government, oh. um, a, a, a rigorous Protestant-driven sense of independence. It's me or me alone, which is why so many American white men kill themselves, because they go through their lives, they have their moment of despair, they don't speak to anyone because they have to be me and me alone, uh -huh. and then they blow their brains out. Um, and I think this, this trilogy of you know, historical legacy, cultural... Um, psychic wounding from, from and it's not just a um, Culloden. I mean, most of the, many many immigrants were fleeing Europe for a whole variety of, of reasons. And actually, one one of the things I point out in the book um, at the end is the Statue of Liberty, 
Um, now, liberty, the freedom group, and oh. so to speak, liberty and freedom have been entwined with the idea of, of gun ownership. But actually, the, the Statue of Liberty was, was um, built out of copper, not bronze. And the reason why is because they, these, the sculpture knew that the, the tradition in Europe was uh -huh. to create statues out of the melted down guns of the enemy. Copper was meant to be a new thing. It was to escape the tyranny of Europe. Oh. Commerce would set you free, not arms. Right. And yet it's been subverted. So this, uh, the, the Second Amendment has been misinterpreted um, to get to a point where ultimately it it's becomes the preserve of white males oh. um, to defend not only their, their cultural legacy, as they see it in America, oh. but also um, against the fear of the other. And the other takes its form in Hispanic gangs, in young black youths, whatever it is, this terrible sort of fear that Americans, um, white men have there. So is the assumption that violent crime is on the increase in the United States, that the drug war in Mexico is having a greater impact on the United States at the moment, which is why the National Rifle Association is as influential a lobby as it is? Well, um, the, the, the NRA has this position that they believe fundamentally that more um, reduces levels of violence. And so, so the standard thing, when there's a mass shooting, the standard response is, if the teachers arm themselves, then they would just take out the mass shooter. Um, and, and America is the only country in the world who has um, loosened its gun laws following a mass shooting. Right. Um, so after um, a Texas mass shooting where 22 were killed in a diner, uh, Texas passed the, um, the right to have a concealed carry firearm. Um, the intriguing thing about the debate around do more guns cause more gun deaths, um, well, it, it's about causality. It's very hard generally in life to produce, say that one thing definitely led to another because we're all, we all live in a, in a network where there's lots of influences. Oh. However, it is, it is true to say that where there are more guns, there are more gun deaths. That's a truism. Um, causality is the hard one. But, and one of the things that the American NRA claim is they say, well, look, there's been a, a rise in gun ownership and yet a flatlining in gun deaths. Mm -hmm. At that last, there's around 10,000 gun deaths um, a year in America right. and um, from, from homicides, not from suicides, mm -hmm. which is another 20,000. So around 30,000 people are dying from guns a year in America. But there's been a flatlining in the last 10 years of gun deaths, even though there's been a marked rise in gun ownership. Um, but the thing that nobody takes into account is how many people are being shot and wounded but don't die. Um, and one of the things that's happened in the last 10 years mm. is America's surgeons have learned the hard way on the battlefields of Iraq and Afghanistan mm. how to stop someone dying on the table in front of them. Um, so, and there have been remarkable medical advances in the last 10 years. They have these tiny little sponges. If you inject somebody, it expands and stops um, you bleeding out. So um, I, I did the figures and found that there's probably been uh, an increase in the region of um, 680 percent in gun woundings in the last 10 years in in the United States and that's too completely unreported so America has categorically emphatically got a more dangerous place there was a, a, a writer recently wrote a book called the angels of our better nature and he claimed the world generally was getting a safer place because he claimed that um, if you looked at the number per capita dying in um, let's say the Trojan War mm. was significantly higher than it is today he, he wrote the entire book without including had been invented, which I think is just a, a ludicrous um, position to have. <laughs> so is medical advances have reduced a gun death. So in the, in the American Civil War, mm. um, something like 78% uh, of all deaths were down to gunshot. We, by by um, Afghanistan, um, the likelihood of you dying if you were shot was 5% as a soldier. So, um, you know, it was, it's mm. basically a headshot has to kill yeah. you. Everything else is, is fair game. Um, now, in, with regards to causality and effect, the most shocking element of, of American <laughs> culture, in a way, is how it's affected Central American culture. Um, and by that, I mean the, the numbers of guns, well, the number of gun deaths mm. in places like Honduras, El Salvador, 
um, Mexico are just through the roof. For, for, the, for five years, for, for three years, a place called Ciudad Juarez in northern Mexico, um, which is on the border of, in Texas, mm -hmm. um, was considered the most dangerous place in the world for gun deaths. So something in the region of 175 people were killed every, um, per 100,000. Taking into account America, which we think is, we just associate America with gun deaths, only around five per 100,000 die from gun deaths. So 173 off the scale. And the intriguing thing is Ciudad Juarez is on the border. Across the border mm. is El Paso. El Paso is, for the last five years, has been considered the safest city in America. So the difference between heaven and hell is, is, a, is a barbed wire fence. Um, and something in the region of 90% yeah. of all guns found in homicides in Mexico have originated in the US or come from Europe via the US. Um, there's only 90%? One, yeah, there's only one gun shop in Mexico. <laughs> Uh, and I'm pretty sure that's not supplying the cartels. The cartels have come out and said, we only buy American guns. Uh, and, and they get them specifically made to order. So you get these gold-plated guns made in you know, Texas mm. going over and then being used in a gun land killing in, um, in the South. I mean, I, I went as part of this book to um, San Pedro Sula, which is the most dangerous city last year in the world. Um, and I saw 12 bodies in three days. On the, the moment I landed, three yeah. women were killed just in the street. And this is something that just not, doesn't even get reported, let alone making a thing. Death is so commonplace there. And when they investigate, they almost always find an American gun. Um, so one of the most curious things was um, for a period, for 10 years, put in by the Clinton regime, they had this um, ban on semi-automatic mm. weaponry. So effectively, what people call assault rifles in the US were banned. Um, ten years on, it was a ten-year ban, they lifted that ban. In, in, um, but the only people who didn't lift the ban um, were the, uh, the states of, well, I don't know, the, uh, there was another state that didn't, but um, of, on the Mexican border, California didn't lift the ban, Texas did. Um, immediately after that, deaths did not rise south of the border in California. South of the border of Texas, they went up sharply because people just went over the border and got more powerful weapons, and people started shooting it up more. That's why Ciudad Juarez became the epicenter of gun violence, and uh, Tijuana didn't. Goodness me. Before we ask you for any thoughts or questions that you have of Ian, two very quick questions, and moving away from the US for a moment. Norway. Yeah. Uh, I was on a platform with the minister in Norway, who told me, and I've never actually checked this out, I'd be interested to hear your view, that while in, quanti in quantitative terms it's not the biggest number, but per capita, Norway produces more ammunition than anywhere else on the planet, mm. which really surprised me. And of course, an absolutely tragic shooting on an island yeah. just off the country. Victoria, yeah. But what, what I found so extraordinary about what you write about Norway in the book was the way in which Norway responded yeah. to that tragic shooting. Yeah, I mean, Norway is the 14th largest arms exporter in the world. Um, in terms of small arms, um, in the last 10 years, it's exported half a billion uh, dollars worth of small arms and ammunition. So, yeah, it, it does have an impact. Um, the... The Norwegian, I mean, uh, obviously Anders Breivik went out and firstly he blew um, he, he put a, an improvised explosive device in downtown Oslo and took out a whole number of lives and injured hundreds there. But then he, he there was a labor, youth labor meeting on this idyllic island of Otoya um, in, in one of the, the lakes just north of Oslo. And he traveled there in, in, um, uh, in, in the Norwegian summer and dressed himself as a policeman. And this is, I think, very telling. He, he put in earplugs because he didn't want to hurt his ears. And he just walked around this island shooting all these teenagers. And he ended up killing. Um, and the debate immediately afterwards in Norway was his relationship with his mother and how the state had failed. Lots of concern in there. Mm. Um, his relationship with his mother was very curious. The, the social services had tried to intervene, but at the time, when his uh, child, Norway, believed that the primacy had to result in the child always staying with the mother. They thought that you can't break that bond. Yeah. 
But it was a bond that was so warped that Brevik once bought his mother a dildo. Um, but that kind of curious, horrific fact meant that people were blinded, I think, by any debate around guns. Nobody had the debate around guns. Now, I think that there's a difference between having um, the ability to get your hands on a single shot rifle and then a semi-automatic rifle or a handgun. 90% of the world's killings by guns are with handguns. Mm. Um, after we had Dumblane um, and, um, uh, and Hungerford, we banned semi-automatics and we banned, well, we banned most semi -automatics. Actually, uh, there's one thing I, I found in the book. You can have a semi-automatic rifle in Britain still, but it's, um, it's called a, it's a, it, it, it fires the outside of the bullet. This one I've become a geek. But actually, it fires <laughs> the outside of the bullet, not the inside of the bullet, which means it's not that powerful a, mm. a rifle. But you can't get handguns generally or semi-automatics in Britain. They didn't have that debate in, in Norway. Um, and I think it's because um, of this sort of ultimate position that if it's almost like, well, particularly in Europe, and this isn't necessary in America, but the hunting elite are also those who reside in power. So, I mean, in Britain, for instance, we still massively subsidise... We still massively subsidise many elements of the hunting culture from mm. the government. Um, and the same applies in Norway. And I think it was e it's easier to have a debate about the, the, the warped mentality of an individual mm. than to have a, a, a much more impactful debate around the rights of gun ownership. We had in Britain, and it was seen to work. They did in Australia. After a massacre in Australia, they got rid of semi-automatics and handguns. And the consequence was, in the, in the 25 years before the massacre that caused them in, in Australia to have a shift, um, there had been something like 17, it's four or more people killed. Yeah. It, it, since then, they haven't had one. One mass shooting. It's extraordinary. I have a whole lot of other questions, but I could go on for hours. So let's first see whether any of you would like to either just make comments or would like to ask Ian. Shall I just read the last Do you want to do that yeah. now or after some questions from well, the we audience? It's entirely up to you. Well, it could, okay, we could... We, uh, Should we just do wondering it right if I'd leave on a, on a bad note. That's <laughs> <laughs> depressing. I'm slash my wrist. Let's do it later. Let's do it later. <laughs> yes, the lady in the front and the lady here. Was there a hand there? <laughs> Hi, um, I would just like to ask, um, as you've travelled the world, and you've obviously done quite a bit of that, have you seen a relationship between the availability and the proliferation of small arms and the continuation of poverty in, um, well, particularly in emerging economies and low-income countries? Um, absolutely. I mean, uh, in the places where I have felt most terrified that I was going to be killed, uh, there was basically no formal infrastructure or economic. Uh, so basically Somalia, uh, Iraq, some parts of Pakistan, um, some of the more jungle regions of Colombia, um, Honduras, a lot of places where I thought I was going to die, uh, Honduras and El Salvador. I mean, the, 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 the GDP is, is very low. Um, so I think there's a, an intrinsic connection between... Um, violence and poverty, absolutely. Um, because pe pe uh, people end up doing whatever they can to, to make a, a living. Um, and, you know, so in Central America, um, it, the easiest way to become relatively rich in Central America is to become a drug dealer. And the easiest way to get shot in Central America is to become a drug dealer. So um, I, I think you get that sort of um, correlation, definitely. Um, the, 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 the counter element of that is in many countries where there's high levels of poverty, there aren't that high levels of gun suicide. And that's kind of curious. So gun suicide is, is the highest in Europe is in Switzerland, and the highest in the Americas is in, is in America. And in those, country, in those regions, it's also very high in richer states. So there is some sort of curious counter position on that. The lady at the back and then the gentleman here. Sorry, I wondered if I could ask two questions. Uh, the first one was, did you find any redeeming features in the man that shot 80 people? And uh, the second was, views on the case of Oscar Pistorius. 
Goodness. Uh, I'll have to throw that to you. Um, uh, the, the, the first, I think, it's sort of inter interlinked to, to the question asked just before. Um, I mean, I don't want to come across like a bleeding heart liberal, but when you, I mean, this was my point, is sometimes people are so caught in an environment where they, they cannot even conceive of a life outside being part of a gang. So, I mean, I've been in, in where I met him, I was in El Salvador, and I went to a, another region where, you know, I was told very explicitly that if I wasn't, if I hadn't been invited into that region, I would have been killed. And every single building had a gang sign graffitied on it. Um, so th that, that is just a life led. I mean, it was, um, and in order to survive, you have to kill. So in order to become a gang member in El Salvador, you, you have to, at the age of 14, go and kill somebody else. So that's, they used to have, a, a, they, they're called the Maras and um, uh, the Calle Ocho, uh, Dici Ochos. And one of, the, one of the, the traditional methods of getting in the gang is you had to be kicked by your fellow gang members for 18 seconds. Um, but then they decided actually just get them to kill someone. That shows greater loyalty. So you're, you're immediately immersed in that culture of killing. And um, I mean, clearly this guy was a psychopath because you don't have to kill 80 people. He enjoyed what he did. Um, are there any really, it's difficult to find a redeeming feature of somebody who's killed a four-year-old, um, but would I want him, as some Americans would, would I want him to die on a gurney with a needle in his arm? No, I wouldn't. I, wouldn't. I mean, I, I think you have to place him within the context. Um, as, I mean, in terms of Oscars, I mean, I, I, I don't want to go into the whole trial, but the bottom line is, had there not been a gun in the house, he wouldn't have killed, I mean, maybe it would have... Uh, well, he, he wouldn't have had the argument that it was a burglar because he would have had to stab her. So the gun creates this distance. That's really what I, I think is, is another element of the gun, is that, you know, it's a bit self-evident. But the fact that all it takes is that to have a consequence, whether it's taking your own life or taking somebody else's life, means that it's not visceral, it's not as personal as stabbing somebody in the chest. Um, and that's very much something that, that I was told repeatedly when I met doctors, when I met um, people who, who had, um, had arrested gun um, uh, killers, is that there was a distance, and, and often it was just in the heat of an argument, somebody was killed, because you know, it was an easy thing to do. So, I mean, is Oscar, well, I would, if we had a young in the house, then he'd have had a lot more answering to do in terms of who he knew, um, whether it was a burglar or not. I think, I mean, in South Africa, just very quickly to add to that, is a lot of people seem to think that he clearly has anger problems and gun issues. Um, there have been, as I'm sure you're aware, incidents with him letting off guns in restaurants and discos and various other things. Um, interestingly, a lot of black South Africans think that he got off because he was wealthy and famous. Um, I actually think the South African justice system did fairly well on the case, given, given that particular case and the circumstances. Yeah. But, it's a long but, it, but it's interesting that just the number of uh, murders that, are, that never end up in trial in South Africa, a huge number. Um, Absolutely. I mean, it's just bursting at the seams. And, and in the book, I, I did spend some time in, uh, for the book, I spent some time in um, a South African hospital. And it just was this endless stream of young black men who have been shot. Mm. Just, I mean, to the point where uh, the, they, they had to put the beds in the corridors because they couldn't put everyone inside. And it was all young black men. <coughs> a, fr a friend of mine in Guguletu, a township just outside Cape Town, um, was murdered outside a party um, 13 and a half years ago now. They know who killed him and his trial still hasn't reached a conclusion 13 and a half years later, very sadly. Gentleman over here, and then I've noticed you here. Thanks very much. Um, I was impressed at your reference to Stephen Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nation, which is somewhat controversial a book because it's often perceived as having quite a sort of Whiggish notion that everything gets better over time uh, in some sort of programmatic way. But 
one of his interesting, uh, interesting notions, which, which fits with, with some of the perceptive ideas uh, of yours about corporate actors um, uh, s uh, providing guns to cartels and so on, was that better reporting of violence over time with Im improved journalism and news media gives us a perception of greater social violence. Um, now, his notion in, in, in his book is that less violence proliferates over time in various dimensions as you get more, as you get a more stable civilization. And as your notion of Juarez and El Paso, if the real problem with gun violence in, the, say, the States is white male psychopathy, then surely you should expect that El Paso would be a more violent place than uh, Juarez has become over the border. And now, <coughs> disarming the American populace has always been a bit of a problem in the States because you know, they were yeah. their state was forged at Valley Forge. Yeah. And they have this notion, as you mentioned, of, uh, of protecting themselves from a predatory government. Mm. Fully, those, as you say, white hunting elites have created somewhat of a more stable solution over time uh, than the alternative, the alternative, which would be disarming the populace, not disarming the gangs, and leaving those people at the at the hands of those child killers who you who you yeah. mentioned. Well, I guess there's a um, number of points there. Um, firstly, I don't believe in a teleological view of history. I don't think things were all inherently getting better. I mean, in a particular case in question, possibly is. I spent some time, and I talk about it actually, I was held up at gunpoint in Papua New Guinea um, by these um, the guys called the Angans, and they're particularly vicious. 50 years ago, they would have probably cut my head off and eaten my brains, but 50% um, uh, they, 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 of their tribe has killed somebody. Now, when they got their hands on semi-automatics, um, they, they previously would have gathered in a, in a field um, over a blood... Uh, dis, uh, argument, and then they would have thrown spears, and then the other side. Would throw. It, it was kind of like, uh, you know, a 15th century battle in Europe. The moment they got their hands on semi-automatics, the death rate went up through, you know, through the roof. So I think access to certain types of weaponry um, has not necessarily made the world a safer place. And and I don't, you know, I think uh, it, actually 100 years ago today was the first use of poison gas. Um, and, you know, in the great scheme of history, if you're looking at a broad brushstroke, they didn't have poisonous gas in, in, you know, the Trojan War. Second point, you, you asked about Texas. Now, Texas, the, Texas is, is, the, is the, the joker in the pack of all American gun debates. And I agree, I find it hard sometimes to get my head around Texas. Um, I think the bottom line about Texas is people there are brought up from day one. I mean, the youngest ever member of the NRA was a Texan who was given lifetime me membership at the age of one, uh, age of one day. So, um, he's for, and, and I think there is this sort of gun culture that exists in Texas that runs counter to what you're seeing in Alabama or Mississippi. And, and why that is, is hard to gauge. Um, Tennessee Williams in Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Stream Car Name Desire, said something about space giving tolerance. Texas is a big state. And maybe just people don't have to shoot each other because they don't have to live next to each other. Um, also, I think there is something about um, if there's going to be violent shootings in that region, it's easier to go south of the border and shoot somebody because then they don't get caught because there's no proper police forces. Um, your third point, I've completely forgotten. What was your third point? <laughs> uh, disarming the populace. Oh, yeah. When, which ends up just... Yeah. Criminals yeah. criminals. This book is not, there, there is no simplistic answer to the American gun problem. If I, if I could write that, I'd be, um, I, I, should, should, I should be speaking at the Nobel Peace Prize or something. I mean, I, there, there is no, there's no easy answer. And I think Pandora's box has, has opened a long time ago. This is, in a kind of curious way, this is the nature of, of guns in the self. I mean, I could, I could kill somebody with a gun that was made 95 years ago. I, I mean, if you go to parts of Yemen, people are still using um, rifles that were, were originally used in the First World War. 
Um, uh, certainly when I met this, I met a gang member and he pulled out a gun and it was a 1956 revolver that probably should have been used was like Al Capone. I mean, it, it, was, it was very, um, the, the gun, you know, has a long legacy. And so Pandora's box was lifted a long time ago. Um, my, my argument in the book really is how the Second Amendment has had significant international consequences. Um, I mean, I chart how, as I've said before, how the proliferation of guns north of the border impacts violence south of the border in Mexico and, and uh, the US and further south of Mexico. The, the American military have pretty much swamped Iraq and Afghanistan with small arms and lost, and they, they lost 120,000 weapon, um, small arms in Iraq and 350,000 in Afghanistan. Um, and then you go, well, why is ISIS so well armed? Um, so this, and I think that's part of this sort of Second Amendment belief that somehow throwing weapons at a, at a situation increases freedom and democratic opportunities. Um, and then thirdly, I think the, 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 the most pernicious element of American NRA lobby is how it has um, pretty much um, emasculated all the, the, the most noble attempts to reduce gun control coming out of the United Nations. So it was, it was no mistake that with John Bolton, um, who, who um, the, the man with the famous walrus moustache, um, who was the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., he, he, he was given that ambassadorship, even though he said that the U.N. was just a ludicrous body that didn't exist. He went in, and he was instrumental in reducing the, or pulling the teeth out tooth by tooth of the, the biggest attempt to reduce armed violence around the world in terms of gun violence, called the Programme of Action. And, I mean, ultimately, if you look at the three major United Nations attempts to reduce um, gun violence, one of which is the Programme of Action, and one of which, which Andrew's worked very much on, the Arms Trade Treaty, um, only one of the top 15 gun-producing countries in the world, Italy, has signed up to those treaties. Um, and, and currently, with the Arms Trade Treaty, the Americans the Chinese and the Russians, who produce the most ar small arms in the world, have not signed and ratified the arms trade treaty. And unless that situation changes somehow, Pandora's box won't even be, I don't know, given a veneer. It will just allow to continue to, to produce guns and, and the consequences therein. So we've got almost a billion guns in the world today. And if you look at the number of guns that are being destroyed, it's it's a small percentage compared to the number of guns that are being produced. The gentleman here, then the lady there, and then two hands here. Yeah. Thank you. There's one section of the book which I found um, quite hard to read. It's a very readable book all round, but there's one section uh, about child soldiers, I yeah. think was just uh, Ian, in this part of the book, interviews former child soldiers who are now in, uh, in work on plantations. Um, and, and he interviews them about their, their experiences, I suppose, and uh, what, they, what they committed, I suppose, what they're willing to admit to having been involved in. And I was impressed to learn in that part of the book that Action on Armed Violence, your organization, has actually gone more, gone further than just its research. It is, in fact, um, organizing labor programs out there, I suppose, there, yep. to get people into work. This isn't a plug. I don't, I don't know this gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> you sure he doesn't work? <laughs> he, does, he doesn't work. I don't think he does. <laughs> but I wanted to know, organizations like Action on Armed Violence and others, um, what more they are doing on this? What yep. sort of pressure could they be bringing to bear um, which might help bring about a reduction in armed violence? Well, um, whilst I don't have a teleological view of, of history, uh, in other words, I don't believe that it will inherently will all get better and better, I do think that it's our moral responsibility to try to. And maybe that's a Sisyphean task. Maybe we can never make the world a better place, but damn it, I'd rather die trying than just you know, be an arms trade dealer. Um, what can we do? I mean, that, that's the million-dollar question, but I do think there are little moments where you um, can see... Uh, so, so a basic practical level... Um, the access to psych psych psychiatric help for individuals in the moment of despair is pretty much zero in some parts of the world. Um, I think there's 170 psychiatrists per million people in Pakistan, for instance. Very small number. Hmm. Um, 
And so I think in terms of gun suicides, there can be more intervention um, and, and to try and address that. Um, El Salvador had a remarkable, I mean, I think this, if, if this could, could be something I could proliferate around the world for articulating it, is so El Salvador put a 20% tax extra on guns. And they saw that any money in gun sales went back into victim programs. And I think that's a, a brilliant way. Um, reconciliation programs, I think that, that helps to stop um, warfare erupting again. Um, I think the most important element, from a, if you don't have even to come to a conclusion, is this remarkable thing. We don't know how many people are killed every year through um, gun violence. Um, and, and there is no serious institution that is properly charting through, through the social media that that gentleman mentioned, the fact that we do, every single individual is, is reported. Um, uh, it, well, not everyone, but huge numbers of people are reported in local media. Nobody's putting that into a central database. And I, when I used to run the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, um, Chris Woods, one of the journalists there, said to me we should be charting individual deaths in Pakistan on drone attacks. Mm. And we did so. Um, and we found out that the CIA had been lying about how many people had been killed. But most importantly, we came out with a figure of how many children had died, 365, I think it was, and how many died through drone attacks. And I think that massively transformed the international debate. Until we know how many individuals died um, it, it globally, we won't know where the epicenters of gun violence truly are. We often talk about Central America being an epicenter of gun violence. And I think one of the problems is we don't know what's happening in some African states. So we're only responding to what we know. It could be that the DRC is the world's most dangerous place for guns. We just don't know that. The lady over here, thank you for your patience. Um, I just wondered whether in the course of your research for the book, um, you shot a gun, uh, and if so, whether the experience of doing so had any impact on, on you and on your views. Um, yeah, I, um, I used to run a gun club. Uh, so I'm a marksman. I'm a, I'm a very good shot, uh, which is a bit weird. Um, and in the book, I chart a moment where I fired a, a, machine, a machine gun with um, Miss Cambodia as she was dressed in a wedding dress, uh, which was quite fun. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've really enjoyed guns in many ways. I've just seen what they can do in the hands of the wrong people. Um, in terms of, I mean, I do think guns are transformative. Um, and, and for the book, I, um, I went hunting in South Africa. And I had this, um, this moment where I, I was on this hillside and um, I was um, uh, looking for a springbok, which is the national um, emblem of South Africa. That was, wasn't the reason why I was hunting it. It just happened to be. Um, and this, 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 I was up, up on the, the thatching grass under her, her belly and she was up on the horizon. And uh, I turned and fired. And then there was this th rush of noise as, these, as, as the small herd of, of, ro of Springbok went down the gully. And uh, they all passed down into the plain, and, uh, apart from this one I had shot. And then, apart from one, a little one, and it was a Bambi moment. They turned, looked back up the hill, expecting the mother to come. Just killed the mother. Um, and yeah, I felt terrible. I, I just thought, even though I had categorically said anything I hunt on this day will end up in the pot, I, uh, yeah, I, I think I, I, in an attempt to understand the hunter's mentality, I think I, I overstepped the mark. And I, I write, I'm, I was remorseful. I think I looked like a killer in the photo that was taken of me straight afterwards. Help you when you publicize the book in the UN. Yes, <laughs> that particular yeah. picture. The gentleman here and then here. Uh, yeah, the, they are transformative. I, I, um, unfortunately, son of an um, arms trader um, and gun manufacturer, and, uh, I, got, I got, grew up around lots of guns. One comment and one question. The comment is possibly a tiny bit of uh, your question about why is it particularly America obsessed with guns and I think uh, possibly cultural fetishization of it particularly <coughs> through films yeah. television that doesn't really other culture uh, to that extent 
But that leads me to my question, which is, especially now that we've got the Miss Cambodia story and you're hunting, <laughs> and, and more interestingly, you're running a gun club. All of this feels like a documentary film. The book, the journey that you've taken, yeah. and especially you reading the beginning, which is you setting up a camera. Yeah. And I'm wondering whether that's something that you've thought about, uh, rejected at some point or not, because it, it, it feels very much like it. Mm. And arguably because it's about guns, moving images, the yeah. medium for it. Um, well, the book has, has been, des been described by some as quite lyrical or literary. So I think, um, I, I mean, I hope that it's, um, it, it's evocative. I mean, it's no mistake that I spent 15 years as a, as a documentary filmmaker. Um, and I think I probably have brought a sort of a visual element to, to the, um, the writing. Would it? Well, um, because this is an accumulation of memories from me being point three times, shot at a number of times, witnessing, you know, mass graveyards. I mean, these, these are separate from time and event. And the, the book, to some degree, has to go to the past and the present um, and explaining you know what was memory and what was lived for, for the for the book um, could there I, I think one of the challenges is even if I pitched this to a commissioning editor to turn into a, a documentary they would say well I can't see the thread I mean the thread has to be the individual's thread um, journey. my journey and the thing is I've lived it already so I can't I'd have to relive it so um, I don't I think this is one of the challenges though of truly understanding the complexities of our world is that you know your your father's actions has consequences beyond anyone's your own your father's own reckoning and and this is ultimately what i think i come to i quote a, a passage which i won't come but c.s lewis argued that hell is um a, a well-lit office in clean suits with trimmed um uh, look at balance sheets and, and that to me is the separation of what what occurs, and it's not just guns, it's, it's co the cosmetic industry, it's the, um, uh, the fast food industry. You know, you never see a really fat guy running Pizza Hut. You never see, um, you know, somebody with horrific f plastic surgery running L'Oreal. I mean, the, the, they're, they're distant and isolated from it. And I think this is one of the problems of, of trying to, to merge those together in a visual storytelling way. It's... It's, it's an incredibly hard story to do. I mean, I've made films in the past for instance, about counterfeit pharmaceuticals, and the only reason that that existed is because I found a central pro protagonist who was on her own journey. Um, I could have made the journey about myself, but um, I don't know. I, I worry sometimes about too many documentaries being someone holding a camera going, I'm going here. I think that's why I wrote a book, didn't do a film. The gentleman here. Um, I was wondering in your travels if you encountered any other countries that had uh, an affinity to guns built into sort of a conservative political philosophy or whether America is just kind of a complete, you know, outlier in yeah. that way. Like other places where kind of a middle class person in my neighborhood or in a nice neighborhood might think, you know, I want to own a gun, but yeah. You know, rationally, they have, they have no need for it. Um, well, I'll, I'll get on to mentalities in a second, but the, the, I did meet, I've been by and met a lot of people who sort of had that Second Amendment belief about self-protection and, and rights. Um, but I, I was with a community who kind of wore jack boots and dressed in sort of swastika type clothing. So, I mean, there was really right wing uh, elements. Um, the um, the communities I, I, I go to Iceland as part of the book because they, they have one of the highest per capita ownerships of guns in the world, and um, whereas in Brazil last year twenty six thousand people were killed uh, by guns, um, whereas in America ten thousand people were killed um, last year in Iceland nobody was killed uh, by a gun, and sometimes they get a phone call. Um, from the World Health Organization saying, I think your figures are wrong. They go, no, nobody's been killed for a while here. This is Iceland. And, and uh, 
this kind of um, sort of like a, almost like a gun utopia. And I, I begin to interrogate why that is. And I think there's something about um, a less punitive legal system. So, for instance, there used to be 200 years ago, they would have like uh, the drowning well where they would just take women who committed adultery and drown them charming people in those times. Um, whereas now, um, you know, the maximum se prison sentences, I think, is eight years. I mean, basically, they, they have very few people in prison. I mean, it's very... Um, they believe fundamentally in the right to, to challenge the government. Um, and actually, after the Icelandic economic collapse, the police made the deliberate decision to just let everyone riot for a little bit because they just thought, well, if we clamp down, then, you know, we'll just antagonize it. Um, Guns, there are, uh, there's very strict gun laws in place. And I think this is the crux, actually, for all of the things I've done. Those, those places where there are strict gun laws, but a, um, 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 where law enforcement is in place, then you don't have high levels of gun violence. It, it's when one of the two of them isn't in place, then it, that, 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 they're the two fundamental pillars, I think. Um, so Iceland has a strong gun culture, but I think it's underpinned by you know, other, I would say, liberal, not conservative sentiments. Um, the conservative sentiment of the right to self-protect without the government knowing that you've got a gun in your home, that is the moment. And in America, you know, they say, oh, we have, you know, you, you've got to have background checks and all the rest. Yes, you do through federally licensed dealers. But in America, if I was at a gun show and had gone and chatting with somebody, we could go out the back, he could pop open the back of his car, and I could buy a gun from him with no background checks at all. And that, that is not illegal. So person-to-person per -person private per sales and purchases don't need gun uh, checks, which I think is incredible. Just well, I do understand why, but from a European perspective, I just you know, wouldn't agree with it. There was another hand, and I lost it somewhere. Hopefully it wasn't mine. Is there anybody else who has a question for Ian or a comment? I'll ask one. That's right. Um, you talked a little bit about what happens to a person when they're carrying a gun. I wonder if you could talk about the kind of the value for life that people have, whether they be, you know, cops in America or you know, a drug dealer, like their, yeah. what it does to how much you value life by carrying a gun. Well, there's one thing I haven't really talked about is the, um, the American police response and the sort of militarization of American police culture is very topical at the moment. There are 50,000 SWAT team raids every year in America. And of those, which are heavily armed raids that involve men with dr dressed often in ex-military gear. So you have, you have police units in America with um, machine guns that can break through meter thick concrete. Um, you know, there's no reason why on earth um, uh, a local law enforcement agency would need that. So this kind of curious upsurge of militarization and SWAT team raids um, has occurred to the point where there have been SWAT team raids on barber shops because people have been barbering without a license. There have been SWAT team raids in gay bars just because it's a gay bar. There have been um, SWAT team raids that have resulted in um, gas canisters being thrown into cops where um, a four month old was killed. A grandmother who was shot through the head because she reached down to pick up her. her uh, her granddaughter, who was a, a baby on the floor. This guy was gr growing a bonsai trees, and he was, uh, someone said he was growing marijuana. So they had a SWAT team raid on him. He reached down thinking that he was being attacked by felons and shot a police officer through the door, never having seen him as a police officer. And uh, then he's, he's been sent down for 28 years uh, in prison. So it's kind of this. The, the, I think the punitive nature of American law enforcement combined with a, an absolute terror that they're going to get shot sort of has this ugly combination where by pressure and, and responses means that, you know, innocents are being shot. Um, in terms of the other transformative elements, I mean, in, in areas where it's very corrupt, 
So in San Salvador, for instance, you get the situation where policemen are hiring out their guns at the weekend uh, to, to gang members, and then they get them back on the, on the Sunday night, um, and you know, hopefully not being traced back to them. Um, so I think um, you know, it's, it's transformative in lots of, lots of different ways, um, not, just, not just transformative in the moment of violence or the moment of despair, but also in the underlying levels of corruption that exists. And we were talking earlier before, before this about the self-justification that occurs in a lot of this as well in terms of the international salesman. So, you know, I, when I met this um, gun manufacturer in Turkey, he spent most of the time sort of arguing that what he did was entirely morally justifiable through the prism of self-defense, saying that we all have the right to protect not only individuals but our nation. Um, and, and, you know, you, you realize you've just got just a kind of a rooted mindset that you're never, ever going to be able to break out of. I think, can I finish with that? Uh... Um, there is, when, when Ian and I chatted just before we started, um, I was delighted that he wanted to read on condition that he also read this particular section from the end of the book, which I found extremely moving. And I think it would be a very appropriate way in which to end the conversation. So um, I ended having been refused an interview with Cerberus. And I, so I walked down and I, I write this um, w when I was uh, standing underneath the Statue of Liberty. I'd come to the end of my journey. The battered landscape of memory, the worlds of pain, power, pleasure and profit. What I'd seen was that the guns' impacts on lives, our lives, was divided into dozens of different realities. Our communities living with guns at their epicenters often lay far removed from other communities with other guns. Gun lobbyists never got shot at, shot at or gang members with politicians. Makers focused on the minutiae of a barrel's width, while doctors frantically focused on stemming the blood from the imprecise holes caused by a bullet's spin. This divided world was the root of the gun's hold over us. We could never get rid of its ability to impart pain because doing so meant taking away someone else's power, their pleasure, their profit. Those who say guns don't kill people, that people kill people, just haven't seen the whole picture. They've only seen one element of its transformative power. Yet I had seen all the varied faces of the gun, and to me, it was unequivocal. Guns kill. Transformative, that was the essence of what guns were. They took man's basic impulses and stretched them from the pinnacles of empowered wealth and desire to the depths of pain and war. They could turn an argument into a deadly confrontation, make you give all your attention to a man you wouldn't, shouldn't give a second thought for, save you or sink you. Of course, the gun gives us freedom, I thought, freedom to do as we want, else to do what they want to us. That was the horror. Oh. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, very quickly, I first of all thank Ian very much for an extraordinary exposition of a vast for writing such an important book. And in thanking you for being here and thanking the staff at the Frontline Club for arranging this event, please, before you leave, buy a copy of this book. It is a great book. And again, it is an important book. Read it. Get others to read it. Because this is a subject that if people say cannot change, the reality is more people will die as a consequence of the journey that Ian has uncovered over the past few years. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And um, could I just ask one thing? If you do read the book, and I'm not asking you to give it a favorable review, although that would course be nice, but could you review it? on Amazon or on uh, other review websites. The reason I ask is because there will be many members of the NRA 
who will just not read this book, but just discredit me or just, I mean, I've been, I get attacked all the time. And I have to say to somebody, you know, have you actually read the article I wrote? Have you read this book? I don't think this book is anti-gun, but please do read it. And, and I think by reviews or social media, let other people know what you think. Um, I'm not afraid of criticism because I think I've, I've tried to research it with um, my, my researcher here, Jenna, who has um, put her life on. Um, and I think, um, you know, it just needs to stimulate a debate, a debate that really is withered on the vine. But I hope you do read it and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.